Whenever anybody grabs this mic, they always sing. Uh, I'm not singing. Um, uh, first of all, I just want to say thank you for allowing me to preach here. I've always wanted to, you know, thought it would be cool to preach at your hometown church, and here I am. <laughs> um, and so I just want to say thank you for that, and thank you for all the support that I've had throughout the years. Gary has always uh, um, helped, helped teach me with music and whatnot. You guys have always been kind of like a family to me, and so I'd like to thank you for that. Um, first thing I would like to do is I'd, last, I'd like to ask my dad to pray over the service. Sermon. Well, the Bible says in uh, 1 Timothy, no, 2 Timothy, I'm sorry, 2 Timothy, about how in the last days uh, many people will have itching ears and will, will want to hear the lies. And so um, it got me thinking about how nowadays we don't have very many uh, pastors who will, who will say something um, encouraging. You know, you hear a lot of doom and gloom and a lot of, well, you need to do this and you need to do this, but you don't hear a whole lot of, um, you know, solid good doctrine that encourages and uh, one thing that I think it's produced is I think it's produced a lot of false teachers out there who do nothing but encourage and they don't say anything of what the Bible actually says. So I'm going to do my very best to um, encourage you guys with what I believe that God's given me. And uh, it comes out of 2 Corinthians, starting in chapter 1 and verse 3. I told myself I would never, ever, ever preach out of an intro to an epistle. And this entire sermon is out of an intro to an epistle. So... May that be a lesson to me. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, starting in verse 3. For Gracie, it's in, uh, on page 938. We have the exact same Bible. <laughs> it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, so also our comfort is abundant through Christ. But if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. Or if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which is effective in the patient enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. And our hope for you is firmly grounded, knowing that, that you are, are sharers of our sufferings so also you are shares of, of our comfort. And if you haven't picked up yet, this passage has a lot to do with suffering and comfort. Um, verse 8, For we do not want you to be unaware, brethren, of our affliction which came, which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened excessively beyond our strength, so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, we had the sentence of death within ourselves, so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead who delivered us from so great a peril of death, and will deliver us, he on whom we have set our hope, and he will yet deliver us. You also join in helping us through your prayers, so that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the favor bestowed on us through the prayers of many. You may be seated. I, uh, I wrote this sermon at Segu, and um, it took me a total of about 45 hours, hours to write this sermon, so... I hope my studying shows itself in this. Um, there's three things that I want everyone to notice from this passage. Number one is that Paul gave God uh, the praise in the midst of the storms. Paul had previously gone through persecution while in Asia, which was to the point of death, he tells us. He had, uh, he had been stoned, beaten, shipwrecked, in danger of every kind and harm. He was made weak, had no or very little food, and was pressured by both Jews and Gentiles. We know this because... In other places in the book, it tells us. Um, and uh, he was still going through uh, persecutions, just in a different location. Um, and then Paul also knew that the Corinthians, who he was writing to, was going through persecution. Uh, we can see that all throughout this passage itself and also throughout the book. Um, but the moral of the story is that circumstances aside, he was still praising God in the circumstances. He starts it off, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Right there. That is, that is the main grasp that he wants you to... That's, before, he, before, he, before he writes the rest of the epistle, he wants you to have a steering wheel for the road. That is the first piece of the steering wheel. He wants you to know, bless God, no matter what's going on, bless God. That's the main, first thing that he's saying. 
Um, in Job 1, 20 and 20, after Job lost his property and children, he acknowledged God's sovereignty and blessed his name, stating that the Lord both gives and takes away. After Job lost his health and the support of his wife, he still recognized our need to praise him uh, in the good and the bad. Um, and also, it's very important to notice that in Job, uh, it says specifically that Job not, did not sin, yet he was still faced with these circumstances. Um, this is key to what Paul is saying, uh, because this is exactly the model of what he was trying to get across. Is Anyone can be friends with someone who spoils them and gives them what they want, but Christians must glorify, and, uh, glorify God in all circumstances, uh, including pain. Um, uh, so, really what, what this whole passage here is referring to is Paul saying, how can we serve you, not how can, not how can uh, I serve me, but how can we serve you? That's the whole idea he's, he's bringing to this, to this thing, because no matter what they're going through, it's not about these circumstances, it's about the great picture that he's talking about. See what I'm saying? So he's saying, first of all, bless, uh, to bless God. Um, uh, in verse, verse 3 and 3a, I'll read that again. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. There are no secrets to life that will, keep you get, that will help you get whatever you want. Life is full of both joy and, su- and su- uh, suffering. So, the, um, so the, the key here is how can you handle... Um, let me reword that. How you handle it makes a difference. See? He's not saying whether or not it'll be always be good or always be bad. That's not important. The thing is, how, how will you handle the good or the bad? Um, the second thing I want you to realize is that um, he presents God as, the, God, uh, as uh, the provider of all comfort. He says, all comfort comes from God. Uh, verse 4. I'll, I'll read it from the beginning just so you kind of get, get a bearing of what he's saying. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. Right there, he, he recognizes that God is the God of all comfort who comforts us in our affliction. I'm going to stop, stop right there. I don't want to go to the next part yet. Um, what, he's, what he's saying here is that we need to realize that God is always the God of all comfort. He has everything. God is the God of comfort. And... Um, uh, he is a source of joy in the Christian's life. God is faithful forever. See, now, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Roll, roll it back. His, what he's trying to get across here is that, let me, let me read to you verse 10. It says here, verse 10, Who delivered us, past present, from so great a peril of death, and will deliver us, present, he on whom we have set our hope, and he will yet deliver us, future tense. See, he's con- talking about the continuity of God. He's saying, in essence, he is saying that past, present, and future, God is a comforter. So he's saying God is the God of all comfort. All comfort. See? All, all time, all comfort, God, God is the God of it. He oversees all problems and ultimately solves them. That, that's, in essence, what he is saying in this first part of this, of this um, epistle. Um, and if this is true, we know that he will always comfort. Uh, um, he, he will always comfort. He has and always will comfort. So be patient in waiting for that comfort. In Romans 8.28, Paul tells us about how all, all outcomes are for the good. Even if they appear to be evil, they will always be turned to good by God. But it's very important to notice that that promise is only for the believers. We have a promise and we have a hope that the world doesn't have because we have Jesus and they don't, see? That's why it's important for us to get them the word is so that they can join in on the inheritance that we were grafted in. See, originally it was, it was Israel, then we were grafted in, and now we have to, have to go get other people grafted in, see? Um, so I just want to read that, fir- that, that first part again just so you guys kind of get, get a bearing. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comforts, comfort, who comforts us in our affliction, so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. What did he just say? Blessed be God. He's the God of all comfort. And he gives for the purpose of us comforting someone else. So point number three that I want you guys to realize is that God's people are meant to be conductors of comfort. Let me tell you what I mean by a conductor. Okay, put on your scientific caps real quick. Conductors transmit electrical currents because they allow electrons to flow freely to other atoms. Whereas insulators confine the electrical current, their atoms contain tightly wound electrons. Does that make sense? Okay. 
Um, to give you a visual image, I want you guys to think of electricity poles, okay? You've got the wires running on the poles. The poles are themselves an insulator of electricity. You cannot touch a pole and be electrocuted. But if you go and touch the wire, you probably will be uh, electrocuted because the wire is a conductor, whereas the pole is an insulator. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, in the same way, the unintentional effect of comfort on, of effect of comfort on Christians is to be greedy and hoarded. It is our part instead to be a conductor of the Holy Spirit's gifts. We are meant to be atoms that transmit comfort to one another as the current is given by the Holy Spirit. Did that make sense? Okay. Um, the original Greek word here is called it's paraclete. And what what I don't really know how to explain this. I'm not very good with explaining it to people who don't know Greek, but m my dad will get it, and whoever else speaks Koine Greek. Um, the word comfort here is actually related directly to the comforter spoken of by Jesus in, of the Holy Spirit. So what he's saying in essence is that this comfort that is God is going to give you is a Holy Spirit gift of comfort that he's going to give to you. And when that Holy Spirit gift is freely given to you, it is your part to go and tell others and comfort others. What good is it if we go through something if we can't help others get through something? Grace is falling asleep. Uh, believers are one, uh, are one as the body of Christ and share all things. Recognize two more things about this right here. First, God, Paul is talking to the body of believers as they are a united body. He's saying that we're over here, you're over there, but we're still one body. Okay? And then the second thing he's saying right here, um, who comforts us in all our affliction. He doesn't comfort us before our affliction. He doesn't comfort us after affliction, he comforts us when we need it. See? Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, verse 6. But if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is also for your comfort. And uh, it's, a, it's a supposed meaning and salvation there. It's ESV and NSV don't have that. The KJV will have that. Um, it is for your comfort, which is effective in the patient enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. And our hope for you is firmly grounded, knowing that as you are sharers of our sufferings, so, all, so you also are sharers of our comfort. Okay? A lot of times we, we read over what the scripture is saying, and we don't actually soak it in, and then we wonder when we're in a hard, hard circumstance, oh God, why don't you speak to me? Why don't you comfort me? Why don't you talk to me? What's going on here? And the whole time he's saying, well, I have. You're just scooping, scooping over the words, and those are the important things. Well, let, me find, let me find a scripture that I like. Uh, uh, I can do all things in Christ. Yes. Amen. Well, you're not growing. I mean, that's the same thing that a, that, a, that, a, that a child does, right? He just goes and eats the icing off the cake, and he, he leaves the, good, the, the rest of the stuff, right? Right? So if you're always eating off the icing, how can you possibly be firmly grounded? See? And what Paul's saying is, I want you to do, know these things, that we are all connected, so that you can be firmly grounded. That's what he says, right? Um, either way, whether persecuted or comforted, we are positively, uh, positively blessed by that comfort. Um, so 3a tells us, blessings, uh, tells us uh, that there are blessings in all circumstances. 3, 3b tells, tells us uh, that God is qualified for the work that he does. 4a tells us that... Uh, I can't read my writing. That uh, work done? I don't know what that means. Not important, okay. I'm just going to skip over that note. I just made it last night. It was about 1.30 in the morning, and I was like, that should teach you never, ever, ever tweak a sermon at 1.30 in the morning. Um, verse 5, For just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, so also our comfort is abundant through Christ. Um, short testimony. Uh, I've cried every single time I, tell, I preach a sermon and I've made up my choice. I've made up my mind. I'm not going to cry. Okay. Um, my testimony is kind of simple. You guys probably have a worse testimony than mine, but I preach what I can. Um, I grew up in a perfect Christian household. To give you an idea of what a perfect Christian household is, my dad was a pastor. Uh, we were all the, the, you know, the pastor's kids, you know. You know, they're all like, ooh, and if you mess up, it's like, well, you're a pastor's kid. But I'm getting off subject. Um, uh, you know, and uh, we, had, we had everything going for us, you know. We had, the, we had our own little church. We had our own little place. Everything was going good. Um, there were rainbows in the sky every day, and pigs, in fact, it did fly. But then was the beginning of tragedy. 
my brothers backslid. We didn't have any finances, and our church shrank drastically. Okay. <laughs> And from this, I took a negative response. And I want you guys to hear this very, very carefully because my mistakes can help you guys to not make a mistake, okay? Listen carefully. I took a negative response to the testings of God, okay? What he's saying here is that when you go through those circumstances, don't take a negative turn. What he's saying is, brothers, don't let go. Don't let go. That's what he's saying. He's saying, don't let go. Don't do what I did. In in preaching, there's no place for pride, that's for sure. Um, (laughs) I became addicted to pornography. I objectified women. I became drastically depressed. I had panic attacks. I was fearful of everything. I had agoraphobia. My life was a constant fight, and I lived it very shallow. All my relationships with everyone were shot. I want you to hear this. Please hear this, brothers. My relationships were shot. Okay. (laughs) To give you an idea what this means, me and my mom are still not on the grounds that we could have been had I not messed up. But, you know, through it all, I learned to trust in God. It, it took me the long time around, but I, eventually I got there. When I was about 12 or 11, I was filled with the Holy Spirit, but that really didn't change anything. I was still unsaved. I was living in the world. A couple years later, I guess I was about 15 or 16, um, I became truly saved, and my life slowly turned around. But I want you to understand something. Things didn't magically turn out. They didn't magically change, okay? I was saved, but the circumstances were still there. It's not like once you're saved, God pulls you out of the circumstance. That's not God. Our God is so good. He lets us stay there. But he's always in the fire with us. You know, looking back, I can see how God was there and how God led my steps. But I couldn't see it then. I couldn't see it then. So then more tragedies came. I preached it this way, and, and Paul Vader and Lazarus, so I'll go ahead and preach it here the same way. My brother got divorced. Um, I had a rough school year. I had all kinds of personal problems, and there was some other stuff going on that I don't, really don't want to get into because it's kind of off topic. But I took a correct response to it. See, because as I said at the beginning, it's how you handle it that makes the difference, okay? So although the circumstances were, the, were different, I mean, were the same, I was saved this time around. I was saved. And it does make the difference. I found my strength in Christ. I overcame pornography and depression. And I'm steadily overcoming fear. But the thing is, I'm not over it. See? I'm not over depression. I'm not over, you know, keep moving on, and chugging on, rock on a hard Christian. You know, I'm I'm not over it. It's a process of steadily overcoming. See? You can't pray some magical prayer and everything will be all right. You can't think about, oh, well, let's just think positive thoughts. Caution says let's think on higher things. God, I trust that you'll give me the money for that $40,000 car that I really want. The, the point is, the point is, is that you don't think on higher things and get whichever, whatever you want. Today I'm going to be happy. I'm going to be happy. Oh, my brother died. Ah, I'm going to be happy. Oh, my wife left me. I'm going to be happy. No, it doesn't work like that. Welcome to the real world. And I want you to understand something very, very clear. I'm going to say three points, and I want you guys to really, really listen to this. I'm able to stand, one, because Christ has enabled me to stand. 
unable to stand at two because of the example of others standing. I'm able to stand three because Christ has enabled me to help others stand. Does that make sense? See, I became nothing when I lived in sin. I became nothing. Because living in, in the power of the world and in all the splendor and glory and majesty of this world will make you lower air than low. There is absolutely no more rock bottom that you can hit if you're living in this world, see? But when I was saved, I myself was still nothing, but Christ who was something was in me. See? It's the difference. It's a difference. Because Christ, Christ is good. Christ is so good. And we will never know what that's like apart from Christ because he's so good and we're not. Bad things still happen, but I can stand because God's comfort overcomes our sufferings. If you didn't hear that, I can stand because God's comfort overcomes sufferings. I want to read a much overquoted and misused verse that makes perfect sense now that you listen to what I just said. Many of you probably don't even have to look at it. Philippians 4, 11 through 13. Not that I speak from want, For I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. Not that I speak from want, for I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to, how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and being hungry, hungry both of, feeling, of having abundance and suffering need. He just told us that he ha- has a secret. He, here's the big reveal of the secret. Are you ready? I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Do you see? Do you see what he's really saying? He's not saying that you can go out and conquer the world and, and go and be king of the universe. He's not saying that. He's saying that no matter what you're faced up against, you can stand. You can overcome it. This is what he's saying. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. If you have cancer, it's no big deal because God can get you through it. If your wife leaves you, it's no big deal because God can get you through it. Does that make sense? It's not about getting what we want when we want it. It's not about becoming superhuman and overcoming all the obstacles with no damage obtained. The key to being content in any any situation is realizing that no matter what is being thrown at you, you can get through it through Christ who strengthens you. The secret is realizing whatever is thrown at you, although you may not be strong enough, Christ who strengthens you is. Therefore, you can be content in comfort and in suffering. Does that make sense? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the Father of all mercies and the God of all comfort. And he comforts us in our affliction so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which which we ourselves are comforted by God. For just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, so also our comfort is abundant through Christ. But if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. Or if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which which is effective in the patient enduring of the same sufferings from which we also suffer. And our hope for you is firmly grounded it is firmly grounded, knowing that as you are sharers of our sufferings, so also you are sharers of our comfort. Does that make a little bit more sense this time around? The first time you go through it, it's like, okay, get on with the point. But that is the point. See? People hop into it waiting for some deep, profound spiritual meaning, and it's right there. There's the deep, profound spiritual meaning. Bless God no matter what you're going through. God is always with you. He will comfort you. And when you are comforted, because we all know you will be comforted, bless others. There's the deep, profound spiritual meaning. For this reason, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, 
8 through 10. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not despairing. We are persecuted, yes, but not forsaken. We're struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. See what he's saying in, in this letter, this letter to the Corinthians? He is saying, blessed be the God and Father. That's the bottom line. Blessed is the God and Father. That, that's his whole deep, profound meaning. And I was asked, um, uh, I'm getting ready to end here. So Gary, if you could play something, I, I don't care, just something soft, I guess. Um, I want you guys to listen to this next part very, very closely because it's the most important thing that I will say all night, okay? An unsafe friend of mine asked me very specifically to help her, to help encourage her, okay? And um, she knew that she knew that I'd been preaching stuff like this, you know, encouraging things to, to some churches. She knew that. I, I told her that when I was witnessing to her a couple weeks back. And she asked me specifically, she said, can you say something to encourage me or can you tell me something, you know, uh, Something, you know, that would really help build me up. I t this is, the, I, I, God be my witness, this is what I did, okay? I looked up some quotes from uh, famous people like Abraham Lincoln or something that was encouraging, right? And I posted them on, on her Facebook, but I said, you know, apart from Christ, there's absolutely no comfort for you. I told her straight out, I said, if you want comfort, you need to talk to Jesus. I told her that. You, something you need to understand is that the, you are, if you are unsaved, you're not a share of the comfort. If your brother is unsaved, he's not a share of the comfort. If your mom is unsaved, she's not a share of the comfort. Doesn't that kind of irk you to be sitting knowing that your salvation is just around the bend and those other people who you love, their salvation isn't coming? This is why it's important to tell people about Jesus. And you don't have to be all up in your face and super... You know, you don't have to dress up like a clown to witness to people. I witnessed to six different people, six different families of people, families of people, not people, families of people, when I was working at Sara Lee. Not a single time did I bring up Christ, okay? I lived out the difference, and they came and asked me about the difference. See how that works? You don't always have to be all crazy and, you know, it's, that's not what it's about. The, the point is being where God wants you to be when he wants you to be there. But before I move on, is there, is there anything that any of you guys did not understand? I want you guys to walk away from here knowing that you walk in victory. I want you guys to walk away from here knowing that you will be able to stand when you're faced with these circumstances that will come up. Because let's face it, it, w it will come up. But you can stand. Okay, I want everybody to walk away from here knowing that it's up to us to tell others about that comfort. No, there, there are no, no questions, right? Okay. Now remember that every single time you look at this verse and every single time you skip over a verse that you don't think is important, that is the one that you should read. Okay? If you want to skip over something, no, no, no. Go back. Because this is the important part. If without this chunk right here, you, don't, you can't read the rest of the epistle and know what he's talking about. It's not important. This is, this is the part that makes that important. I don't know what anyone else is going through here. Well, that's not entirely true. I know what Serena's going through. <laughs> I, I know what Mom's going through. And I know what Grace is going through. But uh, everybody else, I, I don't know what you're going through. <laughs> you may feel like no one else knows the pain and no one else cares, okay? You may feel like what you're going through, no one else has ever gone through ever before. And you know what? You're probably right. Nobody else has probably ever gone through exactly what you're going through. But luckily, Christ knows and Christ cares. And he is the God of all comfort. Doesn't that just make you happy? No matter what you're going through, it's, it's okay. It's okay. And if you get a little bogged down every once in a while, that's okay. Just pray to God and help other people to pray with you and you'll get through it. It'll be okay. What, really, whatever you guys are going through, it'll be okay. Whatever it is, it'll be okay. Okay. If you would bow your, bow your head in prayer. God, I thank you for, for everything that you've done in us, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that you're the God of all comfort, Lord. We come to you knowing, knowing that you will always be there, Lord, the same as you've been there in the past, the same as we can maybe not see you right now, but we still know that you're there, the same as that we know that you'll be there in the future, God. You, 
you are continuous, Lord. Nothing will ever stop you. God, I bless you for, for who you are, Lord, what you've done, wh- what your name is, Lord. You're, you're so good. I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to understand that goodness and that you're not some big guy with a stick that just wants to hit us over the head all the time, God. You're, you're a friend who, who wants to comfort us and be with us. I pray, Lord, that they would see you for all that you are, Lord. I pray that we'd be patient and waiting for your comfort, and I pray that we wouldn't hoard it. God, I pray no matter what the cir- whatever the circumstances are, that we would still learn to bless you. If, uh, if you guys could all pray along with me, uh, repeat after me, I guess you could say. Um, Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinful person, and I know that I've done wrong. I know that there's absolutely no way for me myself to gain salvation. But God, I know that you can. So I ask for you to save me. I ask to be washed with your water and filled with your spirit. Help me to leave my life of sin and focus on you. I believe in you. Amen.